welcome to another episode of Anything But 9 to 5. I'm your host, Emily Boss, and in this episode, I talk to my friend Thomas Pound about writing for television and movies, specifically his experience currently writing on the show The Flash on the CW. Uh, If you want to check out an episode that he's written recently, check out Season 6, Episode 3, Dead Man Running. Also, if you want to learn more about the Writer's Room, please check out a podcast called 49 Degrees North that was launched on July 24th, 2018 with Thomas, where he goes a little bit more in depth in what the Writer's Room is like and how ideas come about. I hope you guys all enjoy this episode. My name is Thomas Pound, and I'm a screenwriter for the series The Flash. And you went to film school, the famous Vancouver Film School. And when did you decide to focus on writing? Well, I initially, uh, growing up from, from a young age, I, I discovered acting. And so I, I thought that that was going to be my, my true calling to be a thespian and start acting a lot growing up. Uh, and then as a teenager on stage, a uh, couple like small things here and there on TV. And it wasn't until with uh, a theater company I was working with, where the the director of the company read a, a one act play I wrote, and I wrote this one act play uh, with the intention of like I'm gonna play both roles. I adapted Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for the Halloween play. I'm like this is gonna be the acting challenge of my lifetime at, at 15 years old. <laughs> and he said, "Great, um, we're you you've written it, so we're gonna put it on." And that was the first time I really saw this story that I had just typed out in my parents' basement come to life on stage, really seeing and going through the rehearsal process of, okay, this let's change this beat, let's move that beat here, uh, the editing process. And it just, it awoke something brand new in me. And it, it hit me like a, like a truck of, holy cow, this is, the, not only is this writing really rewarding, um, it's, it's actually a great challenge. And so from as a teenager, I started writing really, really bad screenplays. I just downloaded <laughs> scripts off the internets and read them and a film that I loved and kind of figured out, okay, this is how they are supposed to look. Let me see what I can write. So I wrote just bad scripts for years as a teenager until eventually like it's, it all became, it just made sense in my head of like, okay, this is what I need to do. So I'm going to, I just decided to go to, to film school with the intention of I'm going to be an indie writer director of, of features. And, and so that's what launched me to go to, to film school. And it wasn't until really getting in the trenches, really getting in and, and talking with people who have worked in film and TV and talking with people who, either know or or have dabbled in the writing process, I was really turned on to television writing specifically because with my writing teacher at school, that's all we would talk about. Lost was the show of all shows for me at that time. Um, that show made me want to write TV. And I didn't even truthfully think of writing TV as a job until I started going to film school and talking about it being a job. Uh, And so, and once that all kind of came together, that's where the focus really was like, okay, TV's where, where I really want to go. And are you thinking about getting into directing and producing as well eventually, or do you think you want to stick to writing for television and media? Um, I'm, I'm pretty open. Like I'm producing on the flash now and it's, over these last few years and and years to come, it's such a great opportunity to continue to learn the the skill set and, and uh, uh, producing qualities of, of all these challenges that you have as a producer on these kinds of shows where you're discussing how to shoot things on green screen, which sounds super straightforward and easy we'll shoot the green screen and then put stuff there after but it's so much more detailed than that so this is part of flash in the last few years has been really amazing on a writing standpoint and everything i've learned in that regard but equally so on a producing standpoint as far as how to put something like this together um and so my aspiration my hope is still to 
down the road when I, when the opportunity feels, the timing feels right to, to be directing into TV, ideally on a, on a show that I've had some experience on already so that there's a bit of familiarity with the people I'm working with, but definitely I'd, I'd love to get back into directing down the road. And then when I met you, you were working at Chorus Entertainment, and then you decided to take the extremely brave leap and write full time. Was that scary? And can you explain the process of what you have to do to start submitting scripts to shows and companies? And do you need a manager? Do you need to be part of the Writers Guild to be able to just submit scripts to companies? Sure, yeah. It's, you know, there's not one specific path that can lead to, to to writing whether it be tv or film and i try to say this to anybody who's like curious about how to do it which is uh really find <laughs> whichever path is is available to you uh when it came to me specifically so i i moved from vancouver to toronto specifically to chase writing for tv and like anybody who is chasing anything and which especially something that isn't paying you yet Mm -hmm. (laughs) needed to pay rent. (laughs) So working at chorus was amazing. Got to work with amazing people like yourself. Obviously, obviously, (laughs) but about six months in, I found myself, I kind of had this like, moment of clarity with myself of just saying like, this isn't why I moved here. Um, it's taking a great deal of my focus and, and time. And, and I'd been writing evenings and weekends, every chance outside of course I was writing, uh, even while at course I was writing on web series because I was able to chat with someone who had a web series and needed someone to just do some punch up. Uh, mm-hmm. I was writing, uh, with, other people that I met in the community who wanted to start their own web series and help just contribute in any way. You know, when you're trying to break in, take every opportunity, even if it's just, oh, this person has a web series and they need someone to grab them dinner one night as they're doing a writing session. It gets you in there. It gets you in and it gets you amongst uh, your peers to just get familiar with that kind of environment. And I found myself spending a lot of, a great amount of time working on those smaller projects, which were extremely valuable. But I knew that if I really wanted to break in and if I really wanted to uh, get some attention, I needed to dedicate a great deal amount of time to write a couple pilot scripts uh, for my own series. And I found that it's, I, I didn't have the, course was was kind of pulling me away from that focus I found myself getting almost complacent so mm. and I I would never advise anybody to do this but I I just I looked at my finances and I said okay I have five months and I so then I quit I said five months and I have to get something and so I dedicated every day to writing every day to pumping out scripts and that five month deadline was was looming And at the same time, so writing all these scripts, at the same time, talking with everybody that I know in the community, whether they be at production companies or just friends who are writing or friends who are trying to break in as writers, who who can I send these scripts to? Get your writing in front of as many people as possible because they will then give you a response and you will learn from it. You will learn how to better your writing. You will learn how to get your material tighter uh and people will also start to learn oh here's a a new voice here's someone that is working really hard and trying to get attention and trying to break in and and the writing's not half bad and it's that matter of of dedication of daily dedication of reminding yourself like what are you after like what do you want and it was pretty close to the the five month deadline i got almost right to the tail end when it looked like i don't know if something's going to happen when I got the opportunity then to, to work on my first Canadian show uh, motive. And that came about through a friend of a friend read my script and gave it to an agent 
that he knew and then she signed me and so when when motive came up for for staffing she put me forward so and that was that was a great lesson in the sense of give your stuff to everybody work your butt off try to get your material uh in as tight a shape as possible and you can only do that by by taking notes and, and listening to people um and then seeing who they recommend you talk to and it, it eventually led to motive um as, as far as the writer's guild that that tends to be a step that you get after you start working for a little bit they contact you and they say hey congratulations you're you're a working writer come join the guild <laughs> Well, that's pretty good then. So then, so you don't have to. So it's not like I guess some actors you have to be acting first in order to join their the actors guild and things like that, right? I Same sort of believe, thing. Yeah, I believe so. It's I'm pretty sure, and I and now that I think about it, I don't think I don't think the writers guild is much different. Where you need X amount of credits. Mm -hmm. You need certain amount of uh, experience before you can become a member of the guild. Um, I was fortunate in the sense of when I was in those five months I was writing one production company that I kept going to and, and showing them my work. Uh, and we, we got along really well. They asked me to do a little rewrite on a feature script they had. I did that and that went well. And then they asked me to come back and rewrite this horror movie that they were going to be doing. And it was going to go to camera in about four weeks. Oh, I remember that you like locked yourself in your apartment. Yeah. <laughs> work on it. Yeah, it was. I mean, and this is the thing is, so when I, I apologize, I kind of skipped over this part. When the five months was looming, the five months was around the corner. Uh, when I would have to do something to just stay afloat, this opportunity came in where this production company said, "Hey, we're about to do this horror movie. Can you look at the script uh, and can you do a rewrite on it?" and I looked at the script and, and it was, it was a substantial rewrite. It was, it was not uh, a, sh a, sh a small amount of work. Mm -hmm. And I asked, well, when do you need it by? And they said, as soon as possible, we go to camera in four weeks. So I have now a very s small amount of time to do a great deal amount of work. So all I did is I, I locked my door in my apartment. I had a bunch of coffee and I <laughs> basically wrote for three days straight, like oh, not man. sleeping much. And I rewrote the entire script in uh, in three days. I told I left their office Friday and by Monday afternoon, they had a script. Wow. And, and that was just one of those things of here's an opportunity. I had no idea it would be actually made. I had no idea if my name would even be on the project. This was very much a opportunity of they believed in me. I also wanted to take this opportunity to show them I can do this. And it resulted in not only the film being made, but me getting my first executive producer credit, which opened up opportunities for motive, which opened up the, the guild contacting me to join them. And even further down the line, uh, that credit was how I got my U.S. work visa to come down to the United States initially. So that was a great lesson of, like, take every opportunity. You have no idea where it could lead. Exactly. Like, some people could be like, oh, no, I don't want to save this. This isn't going to make any money. And you, you did it. You took it. And look at where you've come now from taking that one chance. So. And, and ultimately, like, it was, yes, it was a lot of work. Yes, it was strenuous and a quick turnaround. But it, it was making anything, like making a film, making a TV show with your friends is so rewarding and is so fun. And it is such a, an amazing experience to see a team of people who are so passionate to be out in the middle of nowhere, Ontario, filming this little horror movie with fake blood and actors running around screaming and it's all out of the passion of just making this and it's it's a very similar feeling from the first time seeing my one act play be put on when i was 15 it's it's that kind of uh passion for creation that is the reward in so many ways yeah and that feeling never ever ever dies 
No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's, it's almost like this weird drug of like, you're constantly chasing it again. Yeah. It's a, it's a fantastic feeling. Oh, it, it's, it's the best kind of fuel. Exactly. So now I know a lot of people listening to this probably aren't familiar with a writer's room. So can you explain what a writer's room is like, how storylines come together and character breakdowns and storylines? So we'll talk about the flash specifically because you are pulling from comic books and from other storylines that are out there in regards to the character. So at the beginning of the season, are you just given like, here's the characters for the season. Tell us what, where they're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sort of, so I'll kind of, I'll kind of take you through the broad strokes of the early part of the year. So our showrunner, Eric Wallace, at the beginning of the year, he he's like, I want to do this villain for the first chunk. He came in very earlier and said, we're going to do two villains. Um, and he's talked about this in the press uh, since. He said, we're going to do two villains. We're going to do a villain in the first half, and then we're going to do a villain in the back half. Um, I, I can't speak to the villain in the back half yet because it's not aired yet, but he... We said like we're gonna do blood work in the first half, which which that character's already been introduced in the show at this point. And so we pulled from the comics in the sense of uh, okay, this is kind of how the powers work, this is what the villain looks like, but we wanted to do something very different and unique. We try to, with every villain, do something unexpected. Uh, but more importantly, we talk about okay, how does the villain reflect Barry? We talk at length about what the villains represent uh, in contrast to our hero, you know, the people that our audience uh, and, and we're tuning into every single week to watch. We want to watch Barry and Iris and Cisco and Caitlin and Ralph and want to watch all of them be challenged. We want to watch all of them face weekly conflict. And so we will spend a, weeks talking about what kind of conflicts and what kind of stories could come out from a certain type of character? What do we want to see our characters go through this year? What, what challenges do we want them to face? What ultimately is the story we want to tell? So last year on the show, on season five, the very early conversations were about, okay, we know that Barry and Iris's daughter from the future is coming here, Nora. What are the kind of challenges that we can face with that? What are the kind of stories that we can explore and what conflicts, what would it be like to have your child from the future to come and be beside you? So we talk at length about very broad strokes. We're talking not episode specific things, more, okay, in this batch of three episodes, maybe goes through this kind of emotional journey in the back half, maybe he'll go through that kind of emotional journey. And slowly over time, we start seeing the the overall journey for our characters, the, the overall arc. So you kind of go back and forth between this is our story on a macro scale, and then this is our story on a micro scale. I mean, that's at the very early stages. That's That's how we talk about it. So it's, as far as being in a writer's room, it's hours and hours and days and days of talking of almost I, I've always equated it to is like you're trying to build a 5000 piece puzzle, but you have no idea what the picture on the box looks like. And so each of you are picking up a piece and going like, what is this? Where could this fit? How does this fold into the big picture? Um, and that's why you know, you have a, a writing staff of extremely talented uh, storytellers because we all talk about, we talk in the same language as far as what it could be. I would find like, I would just want to sit there and be a fly on the wall for all of that conversation <laughs> like well, the whole time. Like it must be overwhelming, but also really awesome just to hear everyone's perspective of where everything can go. It's I mean, it's it's my favorite 
place to be. It truly is. I remember the very first time I sat in on the writer's room of Motive, my very first day of work, being at that table, and then we start talking a story, and just this overwhelming feeling of, oh, I found my people. <laughs> like, it was this, and that, and that was it. It was just like, this is what I've been, I didn't even know this is what I've been needing. And I have the same feeling every single day at work. That being said, like, yes, it's so fun to debate character reactions, storylines, and what would Cisco do here? And what does Barry think of this? But then it's like, if, you know, to be a fly on the wall, yeah, I'm sure it would be uh, as, it'd be fascinating. But at the same time, I, I, I can't imagine anybody not walking away just being like, how, how is this, how does this work? Because you, we can go from, okay, so Flash is going to run up this building. And then we pause. And we're like, so what are we having for lunch today? What are we, <laughs> well, what, yeah. But should we, what kind of Pop-Tarts do you like? Do you, <laughs> oh, you having peanut M&Ms? No, oh, okay. But I like the peanut butter M&Ms. <laughs> so any <laughs> chance to procrastinate and talk about <laughs> almost anything else, <laughs> we will, we will embrace. And we'll go on these stupid tangents for probably longer than we should about we, there, we had a whole debate of is brownie a flavor that that's that's a pretty heated debate in the writer's room and the room okay. is split and and what and what is your take on that oh it's definitely a flavor oh 100 percent. really you don't brownie is a flavor brownie is 100 percent a flavor i say the word brownie you know exactly what that taste is yeah, but it's more of like a texture. Right away, my mind goes to this rectangular chocolate deliciousness that's kind of chewy. Right. You So you're thinking in textures. But if I were to say, like, can you picture the flavor of a brownie? Could you? Oh, yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. So, yes, the texture is an element. Um, but it is not as far as a flavor goes. It is very distinct. That's true. If it's like brownie flavored ice cream, I'm like, yeah, this tastes like a brownie. Yeah, exactly. So we will talk exactly like this and <laughs> debate like, like, like too, too passionate. We will be too passionate about if brownie's a flavor. And in the <laughs> middle of a conversation of like, no, you're wrong. Like brownie is absolutely a flavor and you're an idiot. Also, what if Iris did this? <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like those, we need to go on those stupid tangents about Brownie to just have our mind think of something else while the subconscious is still churning the story problem. And that's how we often overcome a lot of the hurdles. As as So as silly as it may sound <laughs> from a fly on the wall uh, position, it is very important to our process. Well, it's like you need that little bit of procrastination in your thought process to be able to put you back on the rails again in the storyline. Absolutely. Absolutely. It helps us kind of take a step outside of ourselves. Yeah. And bring you back into the perspective of, and now what is this person doing now? <laughs> oh, exactly. And it's, if we really digress, we'll be like, well, I think Cisco would say brownies of flavor. <laughs> 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 of course yeah. <laughs> obviously just, all right, well, now i guess we're talking about work okay <laughs> okay so how does the writer's room differ for those shows as to the flash are they relatively the same because motive ricky blue and private eyes their original tv series while the flash is based on a library of stories so was it a little bit easier to build a story for motive and private eyes or was it is it easier because you already have these like built up characters for fans of the flash and is it what what are you given at the beginning of a season to work on in expanding the storyline well it's i mean it's so interesting because Rookie Blue, the the story building process on that show is was very similar to our process on The Flash. Um, yes, we have a lot of material with The Flash, but uh, to draw on. But we're also in our sixth season. The characters have gone through so much, so we have to really kick the tires and and 
think in, in new creative ways of like, what's a new thing the characters can go through. So the farther we go down the road, yes, it can become more challenging, but uh, I always love that part because it forces you to think differently. We're starting to do episodes this year on Flash that you wouldn't see in season two of the show. You wouldn't see in season three of the show. Um, so with Rookie Blue and Flash, we always start the same way on a per episode basis, which is we just start talking about emotionally, what does Barry go through this week? Emotionally, what does Iris or Joe go through this week? We're not talking about villains from the comic books. We're not talking about action sequences. We're talking about uh, a story of, so take episode three of this season, which I wrote, uh, 603, Dead Man Running, that started very much of talking about, okay, Barry knows that he's going to die in the upcoming crisis on Infinite Earth. So he's in a place as of the end of episode two where he's saying, I need to prepare the team for life without me. So emotionally, we start talking about how does Barry feel about these characters and how does he feel about his friends who he's going to leave behind who needs the most help well at that moment in time killer frost needs the most help because she's wrestling with her emotions of being in control of her own life for the first time and to take barry on the arc of the frustrations of what it must be like to try to show someone who is very angry to be calm and to control that anger um the trials and tribulations of trying to prepare someone and feeling that ticking clock on you. So we talk about all of those emotions even before we go, oh, and they're chasing a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's those elements we can put in later because ideally the villain of the episode, whether it be a zombie or whether it be uh blood work or whether it be cicada or whoever it is ideally they represent the thematic opposition to what barry is going through so we they and this is this isn't a new concept buffy the vampire slayer did this all the time angel um sleepy hollow this is a way to think about like our villains of the week and how they force our character to go down a certain emotional uh, story and emotional challenge. And Rookie Blue is very similar. That was much more soapy and, and, and obviously much more uh, real world. Mm -hmm. But it was, you, we would talk about, okay, so what is it like, for, what, what's a long distance relationship like? And, and how is that really hard for our character? And what are some of the challenges that you could face with a long distance relationship if you're also a cop and you're on patrol? Mm -hmm. And so we try to talk about, in both cases, Rookie Blue and, and Flash, from that character starting point uh, and, and really try to map out an arc per episode of what they go through. Conversely, Private Eyes and Motive are, are procedurals. So it's, it's case of the week, very similar to like, Law and Order or NCIS, where we really talk about the case. We really talk about like a motive. Here is the killer and here is the victim. And why did the killer do this? And how is the killer trying to hide it? And who was the victim to the killer? And how do our detectives solve it? Same thing with Private Eyes. Uh, and, and that one was much more of a like a heart to heart moonlighting tone Mm -hmm. But it is very much like, here's our case of the week. You know, here's here's a medieval times-esque place. And the king of medieval times hires them because he believes someone's trying to kill him. Then we start talking about the case. We start talking about the progression in which our detectives uncover clues and where the turns are. And so Motive and Private Eyes, the conversation often started more structurally. Mm -hmm. uh, like what the story movements are while rookie blue and flash we always start by talking about what the emotional movements are with the flash i'm sure 
because I know you've gone to Comic Con and stuff, which I'm super jealous of. You're so lucky. Uh, <laughs> but when you go to these things or even in social media, you're obviously going to get flack for the way you represent these beloved characters because they've been around for so long and generations of people have enjoyed them. Now, are you guys in the writer's room? Are you guys very specific to trying to stay true to the comic without going too far off the rails in regards to trying to make sure the conflicts in Barry's life outside of being a superhero reflect that of what would be happening when he's in his suit? Uh, I mean, we certainly, we try to certainly keep loyal to the comics in spirit. I would say more than anything. We try to keep loyal to the comics of, in, in the sense of like who the character is at their core and, and the tone. Like Barry Allen is very much a character who is, you know, he's he's the good guy. He has a very clear sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. He has a very clear sense of justice. He's he's someone who watched his mother be murdered uh, and set out to solve who was behind it while his father was wrongly convicted of that murder. So he's someone who has more optimism and spirit than really anybody I've ever written for. So we constantly are talking about keeping that clear. It's very hard to, in my opinion, to make Barry pessimistic. And it's that, feels like we're going against the comic um if he is completely reckless about his friends or or innocence that feels like we're going against the comics um so there's some like just tenants fundamental tenants that we try to stick to um at the very beginning of the series greg berlanti wrote on the whiteboard in our writer's room, three words, which have become the pillars of our show. Uh, it's heart, humor, and spectacle. And so we, every single episode, we keep that in mind because any episode of The Flash should have those three elements working together equally. Well, that's awesome. I really like that. Yeah, it's it's always a great way to anchor yourself like because it's it's very easy to go down the path of a story and kicking around what ifs what if this what if that what if whatever and but at the end of the day we always look back to those three words as as our anchor as our focal point because okay. that is what the show is um and it's it's changed the way that i i look at story and and specifically our story those three words are like a really good perspective to take for almost any character it seems I think so. I mean, it's, and it, it was so interesting joining the show on season four. Uh, Cause I was, I was a fan of the show before joining it. I watched it every week from the day it premiered. And when I saw those three words and I understood what they meant, that was the first time where I, I looked back and I rewatched all those seasons and I, I you see it in every episode mm -hmm. In every, every episode of the flash, ideally um, it'll make you laugh It'll make you awe in spectacle and in a cool action sequence. And hopefully it'll make you cry. Uh, so those are the three things that we, we try to always hook into. And that always influences the types of stories that we, we discuss. Um, that's, that's really awesome. It's like, a, it's like a heartwarming way of looking at the whole show. It's like very, I don't know, sort of sweet. <laughs> yeah. And so um, what was the application process to join the Flash writing team? Did you know they were looking for more writers or was it like, how were you even offered the job? You know, like getting this one was very similar to how Motive came about and how Torment came about, which there was a, uh, a colleague who I've worked with before. Uh, he, he put me forward for an opportunity uh, which eventually led to me meeting an executive at the CW and we hit it off and, and we were just chatting and, and they asked, she asked me, she's like, what do you, what do you think about superheroes and our superhero shows? Cause that's not what I was there for at the time. 
and mm -hmm. I, I, I asked permission to gush. She said permission granted, and I, I, I just went off about <laughs> loving comic books since I was a kid. I have a Superman tattoo. I've watched all these shows since they aired, and like I just gushed. And she said, okay, great, because Flash needs writers. Do you mind if I put you forward? I said, please, please do. And so she put me forward, and I was living in Toronto at the time. I was working on Private Eyes, and so I went back, and I was on Private Eyes, and I got a call saying, okay, the Flash guys want to meet you to interview, and they need to see you Thursday. Well, I was on, I was working at the time, so getting this needed to be kind of a cloak and dagger operation. So I, I mm -hmm. told my boss at the time, I said, Hey, I kind of have this like minor dental surgery. I need to have Thursday. Narcotics are pretty heavy. I'm going to be out for the day, but I'll be back Friday. It's like, Oh yeah. Okay. And so <laughs> Thursday morning in Toronto, I get on a plane. I fly to LA. I grab a rental car. I drive to Burbank. I have a, a meeting with the showrunner and, and, and the other executive producer where we just, talk about who I am and, and we get a sense of each other. Uh, and that's what a lot of those interviews when it comes to getting on a show is really about is, can I spend 10 hours a day with this person? Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to be in the room together? Are we going to get on each other's nerves when we talk about if brownies a flavor or not? <laughs> uh, those kinds of things. And so once the interview was done. I got back in the car. I drove back to the airport. I took a red eye to Toronto and I was straight back at work on Friday. Oh, wow. And that's how the job came about. Um, they had read both the CW and the showrunner and exec producer had read samples of my work. They'd read uh, my, my own pilot scripts. So they knew that I could write. Mm -hmm. They knew my abilities were there on the page. So the interviews are really just a sense of like, is this person, um, how's this person going to fit in with the environment? You're able to fight your way through a brownie discussion. <laughs> yeah, we, we could, we could uh, playfully discuss the merits of the brownie flavor without insulting each other. But I mean, let's, let's be fair. The brownie is a flavor. I feel like if I ever interview someone in the future, I want to ask them, and how do you feel? Is brownie a flavor? Or... <laughs> and that will their answer will determine their job. That's just how it should be. I know, but I'm still not 100% sold on how I feel about it right now. <laughs> it's really, uh, I'm really having an issue with this, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, so you can understand why the writer's room got so divided and so um, vocal about this exact conversation. We, oh, I 100% uh, agree. <laughs> it is still a hot topic in the room. If someone brings it up, we're just like, okay, are we are we are we doing this today? Ah, <laughs> uh, here we go. The great brownie debate. <laughs> oh, the brownie debate. Here we go. <laughs> so, when you complete the episode that you have written for, no, obviously. So all of you write together on one episode or are you just given specific episodes to write on and then you're given the title of writer for that episode? How does that work? How does getting your title on the episode? Sure. So uh, we have a giant whiteboard in our kind of our bullpen of our office, which has a grid of each episode number. So from episode one to twenty two. Uh, the dates in which those episodes are going to be prepped and then the dates they're going to be shot and then the date it airs. Along we have who's directing that episode um, and then there's a column for who's writing that episode. And on every episode of The Flash, for the most part, it's two writers per script. And that's because we have so many episodes to get through in the year. We just need two writers on each one to just to, to be able to crank them out and keep moving. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's just once the train leaves the station, once we start shooting in July, it's just go, go, go. And we'll come into the office on any given Tuesday. Uh, it's not Tuesday specific, but just any random day. And we'll see the big whiteboard. And writers' names will be filled out in the writers' column next to particular episodes. And that's that's our showrunner 
assigning the teams and assigning which episodes. Um, our showrunner has been really wonderful about, he, he's extremely open to if you feel a, a particular connection and passion for any character or story that we are planning to do, let him know and he will do everything in his power to to make that happen. And, and he's done that with myself a couple of times this year and I'm, I'm eternally grateful for. Um, so it's it's assigned to his discretion as far as our individual titles, uh, you know, we have those built in and that's based on experience. This year I'm a co-producer um, on the show and that's been earned from the previous two years of work. And does that add a lot more work to your title or is it just something sort of that they give to writers as they move up in, I guess, in experience in the writer's room? There's, it's a little bit of, both. I mean, the the hierarchy is there and it helps for when it comes time to make a decision. Because like we can all debate for mm -hmm. hours on end, but at the end of the day, we got to keep moving. Yeah. And if the room is really divided, the person in the room on that episode who has the highest rank makes the decision. And we respect that and we move forward. At the end of the day, it's our showrunner who has the final decision on everything. So... Mm -hmm. It's a matter of our job in the room is to have a story prepared that is as tight as possible to what we think the showrunner would want to do because his time is so precious. He's everywhere. He's doing 20 things at once that when he comes in the room to hear a story, our job is to make sure that it is as close to what he's looking for as possible. Um, and the same, the same objective applies to when we write the scripts and when we produce the episodes, et cetera. It's, um, it's, yeah, it comes from experience and it comes from time on the show. So it's like basically any sort of hierarchy at a, an office or whatever. It's experience yeah. equals more credits. Exactly. It's, it's very similar to that. And would you say that the writing process for TV and film, since you've done both is similar or would you say that there's a bit of a difference there's certainly a difference um, and it's a lot of it is just because of like the, the community aspect um, on, on TV, you have the writer's room, you have colleagues who you can kick around story ideas with story challenges with, um, you know, as you're trying to build the puzzle that you can figure it out together. You have the infrastructure of drawing from established characters and a whole history of characters in TV every day is the most important day of your character's life in film. This day, this one day is the most important day of your character's life. So when you're breaking a, a, a screenplay for a film, it's often very isolating. You're often doing it on your own unless you're in a writing team. So anytime I've done a feature screenplay, it's me in my office alone and figuring out the story beats and figuring out the characters and figuring out the turns and the debate I would normally have with my colleagues in the, in the writer's room of the flash I'm having with myself. And it's not, <laughs> which is like, it's just a madman yelling at himself. Uh, if brownies a flavor or not and <laughs> figuring out the story. And so that, that can be very different. Um, but as far as like what the work actually is, figuring out the story beats, figuring out the emotional arc, figuring out all those, th the technical side of it is very, very similar. And so do you personally prefer the community to television writing than to film? I, I love TV writing. I, I love going into the writer's room. I love the community aspect of hanging out with uh, extremely extremely intelligent people um, making each other laugh and then buckling down and doing some really hard work. I really love that. On, on the flip side, I really love the personal process of writing a feature. I'm, I'm, I'm doing one right now and it's hard and it's, mm -hmm. I wish I could just turn to four of these people who are so smart to help like with the story beat. But 
with with a feature like it is such a personal story that i find it's fulfilling in a different way well with tv it's like flash is immensely fulfilling to to write and work on but it is at the end of the day it can only be so personal yeah plus the turnaround time for writing for television is so much shorter than film <laughs> oh it's 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 crazy it's i mean i i wrote a script last week um i wrote episode 12 last week which was five six days of writing um so that's a quick turnaround for the actual script now there's about three weeks prior to that of working on it and getting it into shape just writing breaking it in the room and such but the actual writing process is so much faster in tv because it has to be because mm -hmm. it's gonna on, on this date something's gonna be filmed <laughs> whether yeah, it's exactly. written, like it's gotta go it's just gonna be a lone brownie with a question mark over it <laughs> exactly it's this is all we have for this one. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, okay, so shoot a green screen for a day, and we'll figure it out. <laughs> exactly. Plus, with writing for film, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but from the point of writing a film to the time it might actually get made and go to theaters could be 10 years. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's – movies are hard to get made. Movies are – extremely challenging to get made and that's why you really have to love it that's why it has to be so personal to to write one of those because given if i had the choice of like oh i'm gonna write a cool feature or i'm gonna write a cool tv show and that's only the only criteria i have is it needs to be cool i would do a tv show in a heartbeat um it just it needs if you're going to do a feature and this is just my own opinion is like, it needs to be so incredibly personal, not that TV can't be, mm -hmm. but um, I think that just for me, at least that being such a personal story is the fuel that'll get you through all those challenges. Cause you're going to be banging your head against the wall, trying to figure out story challenges when it's so much easier just to sit down and watch Netflix and okay so what advice would you give to people who want to pursue a career in writing for television or film is there something that you know now that you wish you had known when you first started uh yeah well, what would i w wish I, I knew now i would say it's like start writing now if if there's anybody who wants to chase writing tv if you have a computer just start writing now there's nothing stopping you from sitting down and just working out a story to get into the mental habit of figuring out a story and writing it out from the initial conception of an idea to the finished page, the finished document that you can send to someone. Write as much as you can, get it in front of as many people's eyes as you can, just churn it out. Uh, as far as something that I, I wish I knew that I didn't, I would say commit. Like, to be honest, I spent about four years when I was in Vancouver, um, and these years were, were wonderful and, and personally very important to the person I've become. I, but I, I kind of wavered. I kind of had my, like, I had one foot in, one foot out as far as committing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always writing at home. I was always writing screenplays and pilots on my own time and showing a select few friends. Mm-hmm. While I was out there, do I want to be a producer? Do I want to like? Do I want to raise financing for features? Do I want to go and direct and do a short film and go down this path? It wasn't until I stopped and I said, "Okay, I'm I'm giving TV writing everything I've got." That's when I packed up my truck and I drove across Canada and moved to Toronto to chase it. One thing I would say to if there's people who are wanting to get into this, I would say commit. Commit everything you've got uh, emotionally, mentally, and don't take no for an answer. Or, or don't be deterred by no's. You're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a lot of people saying, this isn't right. This isn't for me. Uh, you're not right for this job. That's good. You're going to get more of those than you're going to get yeses. Take them all. Because I always had the mentality, once I did decide to commit, I had the mentality that the yes is out there. It's just a matter of finding it. But the yes is waiting for you out there. So 
you go through all those no's, you're just one step closer to the yes. No, I think that's awesome advice for anything that you want to pursue. You're going to get no's all the time, people, but just brush yourself off, say, okay, I got to keep pursuing that yes. (laughs) Absolutely, because it's like every single day you got to say yes to yourself. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And you got to really consider about that uh, whole brownie situation. (laughs) Yeah, say yes to brownies of flavor because that's what it is. I'm going to a Halloween party later today, and I'm going to ask them. This is a debate I'm interested in. <laughs> it's going to be, uh, it's going to cause some problems. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <sighs> We're going to get a split room, but that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> okay. And what is something that's helped you personally succeed in your career? You know, honestly, it's it's been the support. I I have been so fortunate in being surrounded by people who support and encourage me. Um, starting with like from, even from just such a young age, my mom saying and convincing me like I would do whatever I, I wanted to do, that I, I could attain whatever I wanted to go after. And along with with so many amazing friends that uh, even though they didn't quite understand the pursuit of okay so you're you're moving to toronto and just and writing and just hoping someone will give you a job okay (laughs) even though it's it's such a a strange thing to tell a friend uh that's what you're doing in in pursuit of a career Mm -hmm. but every step of the way I, i i've been really fortunate to be surrounded by such amazing support and encouragement uh that makes the biggest difference in the world. Uh, I know not everybody, people may not have the the same kind of support that I've been fortunate to have. And that's, that's where I I go back to is like, you got to support yourself emotionally and mentally. You got to push yourself because I was so grateful to be able to lean on friends when I was just having doubts because doubts are going to be there. They're, they're going to come and Mm -hmm. lean on the people who believe in you. Um, It's, it's not, you, you have no reason to feel shame or guilt about having doubts. Doubts is so normal. Uh, they, they are so normal. So lean on the people who, who believe in you because uh, sometimes like that's the bit of fuel that can just keep you going a little bit longer. Uh, so yeah, the, the support uh, was probably one of the largest factors which helped me get where I am. That's awesome. All too much you hear people who have parents who are like, no, you have to go get a career or you have to go to university and do this. But more and more, I find because of the internet and social media and stuff, a lot more people are pursuing their dreams instead of just falling into the fold as it is. (laughs) Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's easy to, when someone says, I believe in you, keep going. Mm -hmm. It's easy to disregard that. It's easy yeah. to go like, okay, thanks, but like, I'm going to, but really take stock in that. It's, it means something if someone says, I believe in you. Um, I, as I'm sure it means something if you tell someone that you believe in them. Exactly. Well, you want to push, help push people forward. Even if it's a dream that you don't think they can accomplish, if mm-hmm. that person full heartedly thinks they're going to accomplish that support them because they have a passion and there's so many people who just uh zombie their way through life like if you have a passion for something go pursue it who cares if people say no and try to stomp you down go for it man i support you i personally support you you can start messaging me and i will say go for it (laughs) unless you know you're gonna go murder people i'm not gonna support that (laughs) but if you're if you're doing something you know that's above board i'm all for it man (laughs) <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like it's look, there's there's no reason you can't do anything if you if you believe that you can do it. Like you're look, the first thing people are going to say is no. It's just it's just that's how it'll start. But that doesn't mean that that's the answer. Exactly. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast and sharing in your experiences and giving us a little tiny tidbit on what uh, the writer's room for the flash is like it's been wonderful and i hope all the listeners enjoy it oh thank you so much thank you for having me this is this is really this is really lovely thank you again to Tom.
Thomas Pound for being a guest on the show. If you wish to learn more about Thomas, please go to our website, www.anythingbut9to5.com. That's 9 to 5 as numbers. And click on the affiliate links page. There you will find information regarding our guests that have been on our show along with their websites and social media. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube via at anything but 9 to 5. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the show so we know that you're listening and to keep creating more episodes. If you're interested in being a guest on the podcast or you would like to recommend someone to be a guest, please email us anythingbut925 at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you're all doing something you love.